thankful for the goodness of the Lord this morning? Who's thankful that God woke him up this morning, gave breath in your body? I'm thankful. I'm thankful because I'm not worthy of anything, but he gave me an opportunity today to wake up. He gave me an opportunity today to worship him, to praise him, and I'm going to take full advantage of it. Amen? Because he's worthy. He's worthy of all the praise I can give, and every word that I say, I want it to be something that God would be proud of what I'm doing. Amen. That's what my heart says to me today. I just want to give God everything I can because he's worthy of it. Amen. Let's just praise God together and worship him and believe that God's going to do great things in our midst this morning. I don't care what we're going through right now because there's a God that's greater than what we're going through. We just need to trust him this morning and let God have his way. Amen. Let's worship him together. Lord Jesus, I love you. I thank you. I praise you. I thank you, Lord, for what you've already done and what you're going to do in this place. Lord Jesus, just let your Holy Ghost fall in this house. Lord Jesus, touch hearts, touch minds, oh God. Lord, I trust you. I know you're more than able, oh God, to do the greatest things, oh God. And Lord Jesus, we just place our, all of our trust in your hands right now. Lord Jesus, we ask you, Lord, to touch this service, oh God. Touch our pastor. Direct him, oh God. Use him, O oh God, in this house, O oh God. Let our ears be open to hear and our hearts ready to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Before you sit down, smile at somebody real big. Shake their hand. Tell them it's good to see them. You love them. You missed them if they weren't here Thursday. If neither one of you were here Thursday, maybe you can ask each other why. Amen. You can be seated. We are in, um, I think it's lesson seven. They don't set it up uh, old school style, just straight numbers. We are in the third lesson of the second set, talking about uh, being in step with the Spirit and allowing the fruit of the Spirit to be evident in our lives. It's a good story in my book. I don't know if it's in your book. I don't have a student book. Uh, so I don't know if this, are the stories in your book, big long stories? No. Nope. Well, I'm going to read a story to you that's in my book um, after we decide that just exactly what we're talking about this morning. I'm going to read from Galatians 5, and 23, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. All of them together make up the fruit of the Spirit. It's important that we understand that we don't get to choose which of those nine we get. We don't get to choose two or three of them and decide we don't want the others. We can't say, well, I want joy and peace, but I don't want anything to do with that long-suffering and gentle stuff. If you're going to get love and joy and peace, you're going to have to have long-suffering, gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. And the Bible says there is no law that's against those. There's a fellow named Joe, and he looked down at his speedometer, 
before he began to slow down. And unfortunately, when he looked down at his speedometer, it read 71 miles an hour. He was in a 35-mile-an-hour zone. And the flashing red and blue lights behind him indicated that he had a problem. Even worse, <laughs> it was the fourth time that Joe had been stopped in the last six months. And when he slowed to 10 miles an hour, he pulled off the highway, but only part of the way. And uh, he thought, let the dumb cop worry about the traffic. Maybe some other driver will bump him with a little mirror. And as Joe looked through his rearview mirror, the cop was stepping out of his car. And to Joe's dismay, he knew the police officer. But he didn't know, just know who the police officer was. Joe went to church with this police officer, and it was Bob from church. So Joe's concept immediately changed. My God, how could it get any worse? Joe sank down in his seat, and there was no escape. He was humiliated. It was Bob from church that was coming to give Joe a ticket. A Christian cop stopping and then writing a ticket for a fellow from his own church jumped out of his car, Joe did, and he approached the man that he saw at church every Sunday, a man he'd never seen in uniform. He didn't even know Bob was a policeman. He said, hey, Bob, fancy meeting you here. Hello, Joe. No smile from the big police officer. Joe said, guess you caught me red-handed, huh, in a rush to see my wife and kids get home. Bob said, yeah, I guess. Bob seemed a little hesitant and a little bit uncertain, the police officer. Maybe he, maybe Joe could bluff his way through this whole thing. And so Joe, Joe blurted out, I've been working some long days lately. I'm afraid I've been a few rules. Just a bit, though, just this once. And as he said it, Joe kicked at a little rock on the, on the, on the pavement. And he said, Diane said something about roast beef and potatoes for dinner tonight. Know what I mean? Bob's response was, con was a little dis discouraging to Joe. He said, I do know what you mean. I also know that you have a reputation in our precinct. This was not going in the direction that Joe had thought and hoped that it would go. So Joe decided it was time to, time to change his tactics. And so he asked the officer, what would you clock me at? 71, Joe, would you please get back in your car? And Joe said, now, wait a minute, Bob. I looked at my speedometer as soon as I saw you, and I was barely nudging 65. And that particular lie seemed to come easier with each speeding ticket that Joe got. And the officer said, please, Joe, you need to get back in your car. Flustered, Joe climbed through the still open door, and he slammed the door, and he stared at the dashboard. He was in no rush to open his window. And the minutes ticked by, and Bob, Bob scribbled away on a big pad that he had. He hadn't even asked for Joe's driver's license, and Joe didn't know why. But whatever the reason was, it would be a month of Sundays before Joe ever sat near this cop in church again. He was sure. A tap on the door jerked his head to the left, and there was Bob with a folded piece of paper in his hand, and Joe rolled down the window just enough for Bob to pass the slip of paper into him. Thanks. Joe couldn't quite keep the sneer out of his voice. Bob went back to his car without a word, and Joe watched him go as he pulled away from where he had pulled Joe over. Joe unfolded the piece of paper, wondered how much was this ticket going to cost him. But this wasn't a ticket. It was a note written on a piece of paper, some kind of joke. It wasn't a ticket. So Joe began to read, and the note said, Dear Joe, once upon a time I had a daughter, and she was six when she was killed by a car. You guessed it, a speeding driver. A fine and three months in jail, and the man was free, free to go home and hug his daughters, all three of them. I only had one, and I'm going to have to wait until heaven before I can ever hug her again. A thousand times I've tried to forgive that man. A thousand times I thought I had. Maybe I did, but I need to do it again, 
even now. Pray for me, Joe, and be careful because my son is all that I have left, Bob. Pretty sobering story, huh? And you know what? It's true. It's not a made-up story. It's real. So what does the story of Bob and Joe have to do with the fruit of the Spirit? What's it have to do with the fruit of the Spirit? Both of them went to church. They went to the same church. Joe, everything doesn't go his way, and he gets mad. Bob, nothing has gone his way, looks like, for a long time. And he's still trying to learn to forgive. The thing that we've got to learn about the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit is something that produces consistency. The fruit of a plant is consistent. Lemon trees always bear lemons. Orange trees always bear oranges. Apple trees always bear apples. And Christians are supposed to always bear the fruit of the Spirit. A plant doesn't doesn't produce one sort of fruit in one place or in one season and something different later on. Fruit is consistent regardless of the, of the circumstances and regardless of the location. A hobby farmer planted four fruit trees, four different fruit trees, intended to produce different fruit. This hobby farmer was not an expert with horticulture. He didn't have the capability to know a tree by its leaves or its by, by its unique look. In time, the nursery tags identifying the trees were blown away by the wind. Nobody was, no, no special horticulturist was invited in to identify the trees. The trees remained a mystery, though they did not remain a mystery forever. They were only a mystery until they began to bear fruit, and then it was obvious which tree was what kind of tree. We have got to learn, if we're going to be really, if we're really going to be Christians or disciples, we've got to give the natural process of things a little bit of time. It's going to take a little bit of time. In time, each tree will be known. The tree will be identified without any uncertainty. There's no question what kind of tree an apple tree is once fruit season comes about. By, by late July, early August, there's no question that an oak tree is an oak tree because there's acorns there, right? If you can't tell it by the leaves, when it's time for the fruit to be born, you can always tell it. These identified and unknown trees become known by their fruit. Time proves all things, folks. Time and circumstances allow ample opportunity for there to be a demonstration of the works of the flesh. That same time and those same circumstances also allow ample opportunity for the presentation of the fruit of the Spirit. Time will identify the influences within every person, whether it's the Spirit or whether it's the flesh. Either the works of the flesh will manifest themselves or the fruit of the Spirit will manifest themselves. Either we're going to be, we've got, time will tell. Either we're a Christian or we're not. And time will bear that out. A plant's fruit never fluctuates. The fruit is a product of what's within the tree. There, there, are, there are varied amounts of fruit, but the kind of fruit always remains the same. There's never misidentification if you identify a tree by its fruit. So Jesus taught this. Not by their leaves, not by their bark, not by how tall they grow. It's not what Jesus said. Not by the way they looked. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. I don't care what, you, what tag you put on it in the garden. Doesn't matter what tag you put on it. It's by the fruit that we know what that thing really is. Jesus actually used that, that phrase to evaluate false prophets in, 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 the, in, the, in Matthew chapter 7 when he's talking in verses 15 through 20. 
It's not wrong to study a person's behavior to determine what kind of person they are. In fact, Jesus validated that approach when he said, You shall know their Know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? You don't go to a uh, you don't you don't go to a a a, a thorn bush to get figs. When Brother Hunt pastored here, funny story. This just funny, just funny, kind of lighten the mood just a little bit. When Brother Hunt pastored here, before uh, we added a bunch of uh, dirt over on this side, we added two hundred and 42 triaxle loads of dirt on that side to, to make the, the flat place where that new parking lot is. Uh, the hill used to start just about a foot and a half past the, the old parking lot, and it went down, and, and that was all trees and brush. It was, a, it was all brush. And uh, when Brother Hunt pastored here, all, that hillside was a good place to find mushrooms. He found mushrooms all the time. Uh, under all those trees and all that dead stuff that was in there. And then down the hill, there were briar patches. And in the briar patches were wild raspberries, blackberries, wild blackberries. And uh, Brother Hunt used to go down there every summer and pick blackberries. Man, he'd pick blackberries out of there and make blackberry pies. And uh, June Panshot, she, when she comes, she sits right over here. She came up one Saturday to help Brother Hunt pick blackberries. And she went out there in that blackberry patch with a paper sack, picking blackberries and throwing them in a paper sack. And uh, she probably wasn't in there about 15 minutes before the bottom of her paper sack popped open and all those blackberries fell all over the ground. She was totally disgusted. Brother Hunt laughed and laughed and laughed. If he told that story once, I heard him tell that story a hundred times about June bug out there picking them blackberries in that, in that briar patch, getting scratches all over her arms with a paper sack. So, uh, you're not going to find blackberries necessarily in the thorns. You're not going to find grapes in the thorns. Jesus said you're not going to find figs in the thistles. You're going to have to go to a a plant that bears that fruit if you're going to find it. So, it's not wrong to study a person's behavior to determine what sort of a person they are. What a tree looks like is not important. The fruit of the tree matters a great deal. Jesus used a different phrase to communicate this. Jesus said there would be those that appear to be sheep but are actually wolves. Appearance does not define or determine a prophet. You can wrap yourself up in a big old burqa, a thing on your head or whatever. You can wear one of those long dress things, you know, and wear sandals and grow a beard to your your belly button. But that doesn't mean you're a prophet. It's not going to mean you're a prophet. What, what, what's going to make us a Christian is the fruit that we bear. Fruit, because, because fruit is a result of what lies on the inside. It's what's on the inside. It's not necessarily the outside. We need to bear some fruit that changes us a little bit on the outside. Uh, but we need a, what we desperately need is a change on the inside. I don't want my heart to go from a black heart to a gray heart. I want it to go from a black heart to a white heart. I, I want my heart to be like Jesus. I don't, I don't want my, my pride to change from uh, worldly pride to self-righteous pride. i got to get the pride out. Pride's got to go. The whole thing's got to go. You've got to be careful that it doesn't go from a worldly carnal pride to a self-righteous pride. That's a dangerous thing among Christians. It really is a dangerous thing among Christians. We can get to the point that we think what we look like determines whether or not we're saved. That's very dangerous because there is no good thing within us. There is none good but God. And there's one Lord one faith and one baptism. I got to be careful that I don't worship this flesh and pad this flesh and make this flesh out to be something that it's not. This flesh is going to die, and when it does, it's going back to the dust that it was made from. 
The only thing that's going to live eternally is the spirit that's in me. And that thing's got to be regenerated by the power and the presence of God in my life. I am nothing without Christ. I am, Paul said, of all men most miserable. I'm not worth the money that it costs to put the clothes on my back. It's Jesus in me. We used to sing that song, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. That's what's supposed to happen. A change is supposed to happen. Matthew 7 includes the idea that we shouldn't quickly hasten to evaluation because a tree can be unknown until it's time to bear fruit. But you give that tree time and fruit will always identify what kind of tree it is because fruit is the product of a process. And we're walking with God. Nowhere in Scripture are we instructed that in our life for God that we're not supposed to have progress and move forward. We're walking with the Lord. Got to be careful. <coughs> the Old Testament prophet said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And it's interesting the progression that he goes through, and I think it's purposeful. I don't think it's just there just because. I think there's a purpose in the way that the Old Testament writer said that it needed to be done. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Man, when you get saved, when you get the Holy Ghost, you're flying high. But sooner or later, I'm going to preach a little bit here in a little while uh, in worship service and... Uh, well, I'm going to preach about some of this stuff a little bit. We get the Holy Ghost, man, we're flying high. Our feet don't even touch the ground when we leave. And then something hits us, knocks us down, and all of a sudden we land on the ground. But, ooh, we're still, we're running. Then he said, they that run will not be weary. Right? But then something else smacks us upside the head, knocks us down, and we get up. And they that walk shall not faint. There's a progression in that, that that slows you down a little bit. You come to a little more reality. We're going to have to learn whether sometimes I'm going to fly, sometimes I'm going to run, but every day I've got to walk with God. If we're going to walk in the Spirit, the Bible says we need to be led by the Spirit, and the Spirit of God will lead us and it will produce fruit in our life. In Mark chapter 4, verse 28, Jesus used the analogy of planting corn to teach about this process of fruit, bearing fruit in our lives. A farmer doesn't expect to go from seed to full ear of corn automatically. It doesn't happen just overnight. There's first a seed and then a blade. And only after the blades show up does the plant produce an ear of corn. And over time, and through a very distinct process, the corn becomes a full ear. The proving and accomplishing of productivity, whether for good or bad, takes time. It takes time. So don't be discouraged if you're new in your walk with God and you can't do everything that somebody who's been walking with God for 20 or 30 years can do. Don't be discouraged if winds blow in your life. And sometimes they knock you down. The Old Testament writer said, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemies, when I fall. He didn't say if I fall. He did not say if I fall. He said when I fall. You know why? Because you are going to fall. Everybody. Well, I never fell. Well, you're a liar like your father the devil. Because everybody's fallen. Everybody's been knocked down. Everybody's had the wind taken out from, from their, under their sails. Everybody's walked and thought that they were going to be okay and failed. Everybody's had problems. Everybody's had setbacks. Everybody's faced opposition. The devil's tempted every single one of us. But the Old Testament writer said, Don't rejoice against me when I fall, because I shall arise. 
Look, I've got to get a mindset. I'm not, I'm never down. I'm never down. I'm either up or I'm on my way up. I'm either up or I'm on my way up, but I'm never down. I refuse to allow the devil to keep me down. Because God's given me his spirit and that spirit produces fruit and that fruit is what keeps me going. That fruit is what makes me the child of God that I'm supposed to be. So this proving and and accomplishing of productivity, whether it's for good or bad, takes time, folks. It's going to take time. Paul's time of ministry is estimated to have been about 35 years. Paul preached the gospel for about 35 years. Over 20 of those years, he was a missionary from city to city. He just went. One setting where Paul planted a church was in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a pretty sizable city in the what would be currently, present day, the country of Turkey. And Paul's ministry in Ephesus, he spent three years there. And it was one of the longer tenures of any of Paul's stops. And his time in Ephesus was effective. Most theologians believe that the church in Ephesus was the mother church for the majority of the churches that are mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And since Paul Paul, uh, spent a significant amount of time in Ephesus, the group of people that he worked with there knew him really well. uh, Paul Paul departed uh, Ephesus under some duress, but he left behind a strong church. And, And these things happened on Paul's final missionary journey. After he made some additional stops, Paul expressed his intent to go home to Jerusalem. And when Paul's journey to Jerusalem brought him near to Ephesus, he asked the leaders of the church of Ephesus if if they would come and meet him. Paul's words to them is found in Acts chapter 20. Part of his communication was to remind them how he had acted when he was there. Remember, Paul's time among them was long enough that they knew who he was. They knew him well. They also had seen him under the duress that he was under because of the anger of those that worshipped the goddess Diana. And these people had seen Paul in all kinds of circumstances. At times there had been success, and at other times there had been conflict. And that's just how life is. Every day is not a good day. Now, I know, I've heard it. Somebody said every day above ground's a good day. Well, it's better than the alternative, but every day is not a good day. Some days you wake up and you just don't feel good. Some days you wake up and whatever it is you got, whichever itis you got is itising at 100%, right? Some days somebody says something to you and it just rubs you the wrong way. And if they say it to you first thing in the morning, you're aggravated all day long, right? And some days you forget to pay a bill and they shut something off and it makes you mad because you knew you had the money in the bank and you just forgot to pay it. Some days you're too busy to stop for gas and you run out of gas and it's not because you didn't have the money to get it, you were just too busy, right? There are just days, some days are just bad days. There are just some days that we we face things and we think, man, circumstances happen. Circumstances are what prove what a person really is made, made of, what a person really is about. And over the process of time, people see us in various circumstances, and how we react to those circumstances proves what we've got. Paul's compassion and um, his care for the saints of Ephesus had shown them that he was a man that was led by the Spirit of God. Acts chapter 20 and verse 18, the Bible says, uh, And when they were come to him, these elders from Ephesus, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. It's how the fruit of the Spirit is shown and known. Paul said from the first day, Paul points to his manner and his behavior. Paul pointed to his manner and behavior. Paul never said, do you remember that message I preached to you? 
Paul didn't say, you remember that series I taught? Paul didn't say that. Paul said, you know how I am, not by what I preached, but how I lived. Not what I said. Some people are like hot air balloons, you know? As long as there's plenty of hot air, they're sailing high. They can tell you everything that's going on. They can tell you everything that's wrong with your life. Funny, funny how if it's somebody that they want, if something happens and it's somebody that they want to draw closer to God, the same thing can happen to two people. And I've seen people that have have been just like this, and I've just wanted to beat my head against the wall. So if it's somebody that they believe is living for God that it happens to, then they say, oh, the devil's after him, man. He's trying to get him to get him to... uh, you know, to give up and quit living for God. And then the same thing happens to somebody who they don't believe is living the way they ought to be living. And uh, that's the judgment of God on their life. Thank God for His mercy that that thing didn't consume them. You know, some things are just circumstance and, and, and things that happen in life. And we've got, to, we've got to be able, whether it's God testing us and trying us, or whether it's the devil coming to tempt us, or whether it's just our own ignorance. Our, our, how we handle those circumstances in life determines what kind of a tree we are. What is the fruit that we are bearing? What's the fruit that we're bearing? What's happening to us? Look again at some of the phrases that Paul used to describe his behavior. Behavior demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit. In, in, in uh, Acts chapter 20, you, you look it up yourself. You look it up just to make sure that I'm not... Just tattling and telling you crazy things. In Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 19, Paul said, With all humility of mind, that reminds me of gentleness. In verse 20, he said, I kept nothing back that was profitable. That reminds me of goodness. Verse 22, he said, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that should befall me. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going. Faith. In verse 24, he said, none of these things move me. I'm on a course. It's charted. God's in control. I'm going to be fine whether it's good or bad. That sounds to me like peace. Verse 26, I am pure from the blood of all men. I've tried to do everything the same to everybody and treat everybody the same. That sounds like temperance to me. Verse 32, I said, he said, I commend you to God. That sounds like goodness to me. Verse 33, he said, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Man, that's back to that peace. I'm not interested in what you've got. I'm happy with everything that God's given me. In verse 34, he said, these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. However long it took, that's what I've done. And if I needed to do something to get by, I did it. Paul said, I've learned to be long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit was evident evident in Paul's life. And the Ephesian elders knew from his life, from the way that he lived, that he had the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesus was a place where Paul worked as a bivocational pastor. He pastored the church, planted it, and he worked a job. He made tents. Paul could have gone to somewhere else, particularly a place he'd visited earlier in his life and probably had an easier road to go, but he chose to work there. He felt God placed him in Ephesus for a purpose, and his personal ease was not his ambition. He wanted to fulfill the will of God. His discourse here is fruit assessment. If we're going to inspect fruit... We should probably inspect our own fruit first. We should probably assess our own fruit before we start assessing the fruit of other people. We should probably make sure that by their fruit she shall know them. I want to make sure that I bear fruit that people know I'm a child of God. Not just by the way I look or the things that I say. I, you know what? I don't care if, I, if anybody ever says, wow, that was a good message. Wow, you preached a great sermon. I don't even like the word sermon. 
I, I would rather not ever preach a sermon. I, I'd like to have a message, a word from God. But I don't even care if anybody ever says, wow, that was great preaching. Uh, some of the greatest, uh, it's funny, and I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not, please don't take me wrong. My intention is not, I don't even know, my intention is not to sound like I'm better than somebody else, but some of the greatest churches that I've ever been to, uh, I could preach circles around the guys who pastor those churches. I feel like in my mind, man, that guy can't preach a lick. How does he pastor a church like that? <laughs> my God, when he teaches, he bores me to tears. I can't imagine people, a thousand people sitting in that church and listening to him talk for an hour and a half on Sunday morning. What in the world? <laughs> but they bear the fruit of the Spirit. So, you know, I don't care if I'm ever considered to be a great, I've never preached a big conference. Uh, don't really, don't count on ever seeing my name uh, in the, in the uh, lines of preachers preaching conferences. That's probably not going to happen. And that's okay with me if I can bear the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be what God wants me to be. That's what I want to be. Not, and God didn't call anybody to be a preacher. We're never called to preach. That's a little misnomer. Uh, ministers of the gospel that are here, you didn't get called to be a, a preacher. You got called to, to be a disciple. There's no calling in the Bible to be a preacher. Now, some men are prophets and some are apostles, but they were first disciples. And you're never going to be a preacher until you're first a good saint. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And before I can ever be a leader, i got to be a follower. And if I'm out walking and I think I'm leading and I turn around and there's nobody following me, all I'm doing is taking a good walk. So enjoy the walk. Enjoy the walk. Because you're not leading unless somebody's following you. And ain't nobody going to follow you if you're not bearing fruit that's worthy to be born. Some folks are always chattering about what they look like and how they act and what they say. And, they, and it frustrates them because nobody ever listens to them. Because people aren't interested in what you say. They're interested in how you care. People, what is that? People don't care what you say. Or what, what is that? What's that saying? It's a clever little saying. That's it right there. People don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. So I got to bear the fruit. I got to bear the fruit of somebody that cares before I bear the fruit of somebody that knows. I don't like people who know everything. I don't like to talk to people who know everything. No matter what I say, it's always wrong. Right? No matter what I say, it's always wrong. They know more than I know. I got family like that, bro. We all, if we raised our hands, we all got family like that. Some of us got, be careful now, some of us got close family like that. Be careful now, somebody might be setting by close family like that. I don't care how much you know. I, I, I want to be around somebody that bears the fruit of the Spirit. Imagine if Paul had been dishonest in portraying the way that he lived, it, it wouldn't have been long before one of the, the Ephesian elders would have interrupted Paul to say, wait, you remember when, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm, I'm, I know a man, let me tell you this, I'll, I'll be kind of like Paul. Whether it be uh, in the spirit or not, I can't say, but I was caught away to the third heaven. I know a man <coughs> who had a pastor that, uh, man, he was flashy. He'd get up on the platform and he'd dance. He always had on a nice suit. He always taught all of the young men in his church that they always ought to have a $100 bill in their pocket. Ought to always, if you're going to live for God, you need to show that you're blessed and you ought to always have a $100 bill in your pocket. Ought to always have one. He had a young man that was a preacher in his church and uh, that young man left and married a girl and went somewhere else and, and uh, there was just always something that just didn't click. Man, you, you were drawn to him because he was, you know... Man, he was flashy. Yeah, he was flashy. 
He always had a good word. And he'd, whenever he'd see you, rather than say praise the Lord or whatever, he'd dance up to you, Brother Prestwood. He'd come dancing down the aisle on Sunday morning before church. And he'd say, are you living right? Well, what are you going to say? I'm trying, brother. I'm trying my best. Because I am, and I got a $100 bill in my pocket, and I'm wearing a Swedish knit suit. How many of you remember Swedish knit suits? Remember them? They're those suits that you wore that you never had to iron them. They never wrinkled. So one, one day he got caught stealing money from, from a bank using his personal money, his church's money, and the organization that he belonged to. And he went to prison. And he spent, I don't know, three, five years in prison. And when he got out of prison, that young preacher was doing some service work at a bar. Because that's where he worked, working on, uh, on equipment. And uh, when he got down off of the roof and walked into the bar, there sat that preacher at the end of the bar sucking on a long neck. A, a Budweiser, sorry, a big old beer, like just, and it was forever ingrained in that young preacher's mind when he looked, walking through to turn the equipment back on, looking down at the end of the bar, clear down at the end of the bar, kind of in the shadow, all by himself, sat that young man's pastor, just like that. Never got it out of his mind. Still can't get it out of his mind. Every time he looks at that man, he still sees him sitting at the end of a bar with a long neck in his hand. Because there wasn't ever any fruit of the Spirit. There wasn't ever anything there that... I don't want people seeing me flashy, fancy pants. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm not interested in any of that. But I do want people to see me gentle, kind, good, meek, long-suffering, faithful, patient. I don't, want to see, I don't want people to see any of that. The fruit of the Spirit has to be consistently exhibited. Because it was in Paul. It was consistently exhibited as he lived and walked among the Ephesians. They saw the same thing every time. Charles Spurgeon said, a man's life is always more forcible than his speech. When men take stock of a person, they count his deeds as dollars and his words as pennies. Researchers examined 41 upper-level executives who'd managed to derail their careers. Every executive possessed remarkable strength, and each one of them was also flawed by one or more significant weakness. I'm not impressed by stories and junk. You know what? You know what? Let me tell you something else. God's not impressed by that. You know what God wants? The old songwriter said it best. The old songwriter had it down. He knew exactly what it was that pleased God. Just to walk with him means everything to me. Just to hold his hand and know he's there. He's leading me. Though the world pass me by, go their way. Let me be. Just to walk with him means everything to me. When we get to heaven and we stand before God at the judgment seat, God's not going to say, oh, Annie, let some get out of the way just a minute there. Oh, 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 there's Ed Foster. My Lord. Hey, this guy. Wow, did he ever. Oh, my Lord. was He, he was amazing. He did great things. Come on up to the front of the line, Brother Foster. We've got great things in store for you. Nobody's ever going to hear that. Nobody's ever going to hear, wow, you preach such great messages, Terry Long, or wow, you pastored the greatest church, or, or you did this, or you did that. Every single person at the foot of the cross is equal. And we're also equal at the door to the throne room of heaven. Because if we make it in, every single one of us is going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Every one of us, Brother Harper. David Bernard. 
Anthony Mangan, some of you don't know who those guys are. Thank God, I'm glad you don't. Because it doesn't matter to God. It don't matter to God who they are. It does not matter. God does not care that, they're, that he's the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church or that the other one, pastor, is one of the largest UPC churches in the country. God doesn't, God doesn't care about that any more than he does you, Mandy Dunaway. And if we make it, if we make it, we all hear the same thing from him. No matter our story, no matter where we came from, no matter what we've gone through, no matter how many storms we've come through, it doesn't matter how how oppressed we were or how many trials have come our way. If we make it, we're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, every one of us. And if we think our flash is going to save us and our fancy clothes are going to save us and the way we look are going to save us, we're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. Because it's his mercy and his grace that saves us. And it's his mercy and his grace that develops in us the fruit of the spirit that makes us worthy to stand in his presence. One more thing, and then I'm going to quit today, all right? I'll be done this morning. We've... So the fruit of the Spirit's not a Sunday presentation. It's the fruit of the Spirit every day. Sam Storms is a pastor in Oklahoma City, and he's a blogger. And he developed a list of ten traits that help identify integrity because we have to learn to walk in integrity. David said, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. You can't be a Christian without integrity. You can't be a Christian without integrity. What's integrity, Brother Long? It's doing right when you know nobody's watching. It's doing the same thing when you're by yourself that you do when you're here on Sunday morning. That's what integrity is. That's what integrity is. And David said it's the integrity of the upright that will guide them. Storm's thoughts may help us wrap ourselves around how our fruit can be measured and observed. Storm said these ten things. Stand. I'm going to read these these things, and then I'll be done. A person of integrity fulfills his or her promises, being true to your word, especially when doing so is costly, even in terms of money, convenience, physical welfare, and so on. Those, that's a core characteristic of integrity. Number two, a person of integrity speaks the truth, is honest, and does not lie. A person of integrity is a person of sincerity, They don't like hypocrisy. A person of integrity manifests a wholeness of character, including kindness, compassion, mercy, and gentleness. A person of of integrity is committed to the pursuit and maintenance of justice and fairness. A person of integrity loves as, when, and what God loves. A person of integrity is humble. He or she shuns pride and haughtiness. A person of integrity is law-abiding. They play by the rules, both in the Bible and in the law of the land. A person of integrity is fundamentally altruistic. That means that they're committed not simply to laws and rules, but to people. Could a selfish person have that integrity? What about somebody that's honest, law-abiding, fulfills his or her promises, but self-absorbed and egocentric? Can't have integrity then. A person of integrity manifests a high degree of consistency. Just to walk with him means everything to me. If we're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit, we've got to have integrity. We've got to be consistent. Consistently walk with God. We've got to do it every day of our lives. Every day, every day, every day. Got to walk with God every day. No change. Every day. Every day we got to walk with God. Even if we fall, we got to get up, brush ourselves off, and continue to walk with God. Every day of our lives we got to walk with Him. It's about 10 till. We're going to take 10 minutes. At 11 o'clock, we're going to come back out. Coffee shop's open, whatever. If you see somebody you don't recognize, introduce yourself to them. Let's come back at 11 for morning worship. God bless you.